Many, many thanks to, uh, to Steffi, and um, hello to everyone. We are very, very delighted to now introduce Marco Craig Martin and uh, his exhibition, Transients, which happens at the Serpentine Galleries um, at the very moment in, uh, in London. It will be a conversation with uh, Marco Craig Martin, which will cover a very wide range of how he uses uh, technology. Uh, the timing of this exhibition is significant because it's the first exhibition of uh, Michael in a uh, London institution since 1989, of course the year when Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web, and also the year where we actually uh, um, started with Steffi Simon Gaste here at DLD, the 89 Plus project, looking at a generation of artists born after 1989. And it's of course wonderful that this series of great artist encounters which we've been doing uh, here at DLD can continue. We had Ai Weiwei and his kind of relationship to technology telling us about his blog. We had Yoko Ono here a few years ago telling us about her relationship to uh, the internet and today Marco Craig Martin. Besides that, of course, the idea is also to um, uh, present emerging artists in the context of DLD, artists who basically work with uh, digital media since the very beginning. As I mentioned, we have the 89 Plus project, which has been ongoing ever since it started here in Munich. We had the panel Ways Beyond the Internet, where we looked actually at post-internet art. And today we will have a very special uh, guest at the very end of the program of this afternoon with Raka Haliti, uh, a young uh, artist from Kosovo who actually represented Kosovo in the last Venice Biennale and now lives in uh, Munich. Please give a very, very warm welcome to the great Michael Craig Martin. So Michael, to, to begin with the beginning and before we start with the images, I wanted to ask you, because I always think it's kind of fascinating how things begin, I wanted to ask you how, how it all started, how you came to art or how art came to you. Well, I should say I, w I was born in Dublin in Ireland, but I grew up in the United States and I was educated in the United States. My whole education was in America. And when I was about 12, I stumbled on modern art. And in the 50s, modern art was a secret. Modern art was something hardly anybody knew anything about. And I knew I'd struck something magical. And I decided I wanted to be an artist at about the age of 12. And then I was very lucky, really lucky, because I went to the Yale Art School in the early 60s and my fellow students were Richard Serra, Bryce Martin, Chuck Close. Um, there were, you know, uh, Eva Hesse had just left a year or so before Bob Mangold had just left. It was the golden moment. It's one of those things, one of the things about being an artist is you need luck as well as everything else. And a little luck goes a long way and I was super lucky. And also the, and the school, had been, was, uh, the, all the courses at the school had been developed by Joseph Albers, who'd been at, the, at uh, the, the Bauhaus, then he had come to the United States and done Black Mountain College, and then he had been to Yale, and I got the whole of that, that link to kind of uh, 20th century modernist tradition. To stay with the beginnings, maybe we can talk about the beginnings of uh, the Serpentine exhibition, which focuses on your relationship to, to technology. And before one actually even enters the show, as we can see on the first image, which should pop up now, um, as we can see on the first image, so before one even enters the exhibition, one actually has this outdoor sculpture, which is a sculpture of a, of a light bulb. Can you tell us about, about this? Well, the idea of the, of the exhibition was in my work, I started in, in the late 70s drawing the objects around me, one at a time. Just draw. And in those days, I drew a shoe, I drew a table, I drew a chair, I drew a book, drew an umbrella, each of these objects. And I thought that objects would stay more or less stable, and I drew the things that were around me, and I've continued to do that all of these years. It would never have occurred to me that I could do that, or that there would be the possibility of doing that. And one of the things that emerged over that time, by just drawing the objects around me, 
I recorded the change from the analog age to the digital age. And there's a moment during, in that period, in the 80s and 90s, where we go from the kind of objects that I had drawn originally, which, which were really uh, more or less form follows function. The 20th century objects were form follows function. Things looked like what they did. And then gradually, those objects changed and take on a very different kind of aesthetic, a different kind of character as objects. And also, objects, obviously, as we all know, become condensed into each other. And the objects start to look new, m much more neutral than they had in the, in, in the beginning, when I first started to do objects. And this was something that Hans Ulrich picked up on in my work, and that's been the focus of the exhibition. So my exhibition at the Serpentine is really focused on the nature of transience in objects and the early obsolescence of things. At, in the beginning, I used to think it would be crazy to draw things that nobody would know what they were in five years. But now I think that's what I have to do. I have to draw all the things that are here and that will, people will look at my painting of an iPhone in 10 years and some people will say, what exactly is that? This is already true of some of the images, some of the objects that I've made pictures of which are in the exhibition. So maybe we can go into the exhibition and actually see the first um, space. Because it's kind of fascinating is that besides these objects which have uh, obsolescence, the exhibition comes actually right into the present because um, you made paintings of, of iPhones basically a few weeks after these iPhones come out and yet uh, do these paintings of things no one else paints. Yes, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's a great tradition of, uh, of painting, of making images. And I, when I first started to, to make uh, images of things, I drew, the, I, I was only drawing fabric, uh, manufactured man-made objects, all of which are mass produced. And so they have a certain kind of look to them, a kind of perfection. It's like the chairs you're sitting on. They're all perfect and they're all identical although actually each one is individual, all, they have a very peculiar character. And I wanted my drawings of these chairs not to look personal like I had done them, but to look like the object. So I start to draw them in the simple black outline, no sign of my hand, no inflection, nothing directly personal in that sense at all. So here we have the, the wallpaper, and the wallpaper actually brings together lots of different uh, objects. It's a kind of a Accumulation. Yes, and I, uh, the, the, when, when we were doing the exhibition, the one thing that I made especially for the exhibition was this wallpaper, uh, it's a, which is using contemporary objects. Most of them are electronic, some of them are, are not, um, but they, they are the objects, they're very much the objects of today, they're objects of this time. And uh, I wanted to put, I put them together so they form like, it's like, a, it's like a, a stack and it's also like a skin. Nothing overlaps anything else, everything is on the surface, everything just touches as many other things as possible, but nothing, oh, nothing interferes with anything else. And obviously all of these objects are kind of very much already there, so we spoke earlier about Andy Warhol and kind of Warhol always said it's about showing what is already there. Was Warhol an inspiration for you? Yes, and I, there's something I, 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 coming here today, seeing different things in the conference. There's a lot of a lot of it is really about design, more more about design than uh, than art. And I think that for me, there's an important difference. Um, I, I think of creativity in, de, in design is invention, and I think creativity in art is observation. And what I do is I observe. I'm just looking. I am the witness to these things. I don't design iPhones. I don't design chairs. I don't make this stuff. I make paintings. I make drawings. I make art. It's completely different. And, but in order to be, to, as an artist, to be responsive to what's around you, you have to be observant. The, mo the key thing, and this, is, this was true a thousand years ago, 2,000 years ago. It's about observation. Things arise from observation. Now, one of the things, of course, which is, has gone away here, but then in the next image we'll come back again very strongly, is, is color. And, and um, I wanted to ask you about color, because obviously it's not 
like Alvos, that you would have a, a dogmatic color theory, but color plays a very important role. How do you deal with color in the work? Well, for years, in the beginning, I just did the drawings, black and white, and I drew, did drawings on the wall, rather like the wallpaper, and I was quite frightened of color. Many artists are frightened of color, and it's probably a good reason to be frightened of it. And then I had the experience of painting, I, of painting uh, a gallery where I painted five rooms in five different colors and added images. And I thought, well, if I'm drawing five rooms, they should be, you know, so uh, what have you got? Red, yellow, blue, green, fine. There's, there's only about 10, 12 colors anyway, and everything else is a variation. And as soon as I did that, I realized that I stopped being frightened of color. And the color, the color in my work has no correspondence to the object. The object is a very, very straight, and the, the color represents everything else. The color is particularity, it's emotion, it's what you can't, what, uh, what you can't rationalize. And, and so the two are playing against each other. I'm trying, I tried to put, have them hand in hand with each other so that uh, they, the, in the way the color is reinforcing the drawing, I use, I change color from one place in a, in, a, in a painting to another when there's a change of material from inside to outside. They're usually reinforcing the, the, the drawing, but essentially the color is, you see, when I, the most important thing that I, I discovered was if I And it really doesn't make any difference. But I don't, but you're not obliged to make something. All little children understand this. You give your children some crayons and ask them to draw something, it never occurs to them what is the correct color to draw. A, 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 if they want to draw a red brick, they're going to use blue. It wouldn't even occur to them that they had to be so loyal to something. We lose this as we get older, and I've tried to refine it. It's also extraordinary the way, of course, how you use color in, in architecture, for example, in your amazing wall painting in a, in a children's hospital where it really injects optimism and, uh, and all of that. But maybe uh, one thing I forgot to ask you before is actually the digital. And I kind of was wondering, in a way, because obviously at the beginning you use tape and you use hand drawing, and then at a certain moment you incorporate computer-aided design software in in the working pro process. So I was kind of wondering if you can tell us a little bit how that changed the work. Uh, in, the, in the early 90s, I had been drawing, the way I drew in the originally was, I would draw with pencil on paper, then I would trace the drawing onto clear acetate with a very thin line tape. There's a special kind of tape that can, you can make curves with. It's made out of crepe paper. That, that's what I use for everything. And but so I had a template, and then I would use the template for anything else I wanted to do. I would use this template. And then in the early 90s, I got my first little computer with a tiny memory, and I got it for word processing because I naturally, as a writer, I can't write in, in a continuous way. I cut and paste, and I suddenly discovered there's a machine that does this perfectly for you. And I was right. But when I was using it to cut and paste text, I suddenly realized Gosh, that's what I do with my work as well, in my drawings. So then I scanned all the drawings I've been doing for, tw for 15 years into the computer. And they were all, they had he large pixels. They were kind of terrible pixelated lines um, in the beginning. And then after a couple of years, I started, to, I got a vector uh, drawing, uh, you know, uh, um, application so I could turn everything into and then and I taught myself to draw with a mouse now I don't do, I never use paper to draw I draw with a mouse directly on the screen there is no original there's no paper original in my work it's everything you get if you get a book I have a book of drawings you might as well think the book is a book of originals because there are no other I don't have some in a drawer at home that are the original signed drawings they only exist when I make something out of them. And for me, the computer was like, I'd been I felt like I'd been waiting for 15 years. Where was it when I needed it? And now, and so everything I've done since the early 90s, I consider to, would have been completely impossible without the, without the computer. So for instance, when I'm doing paintings, like a complex painting, like the one that you're seeing there, 
You know, this is a very complex painting. I can overlay the images. I can change the colors. You know, we, this, these are very, very simple things on a computer. But for me, these are critically important. So I can see whether the, how something looks when it's pink, and then I can look at it yellow, and I can save the pink, and then come back to it two days later and change it to blue. And th th I can change the scale of something. I can make it big. I can make it tiny. I can turn it upside down. This is a big deal if you're dealing with, you know, with actual drawings with pencils. This is a nightmare. This is weeks of work. On a computer, it's seconds. It's absolute se So it's as though the computer had been invented with me in mind, and I'd like to thank all of those responsible. Now, we had before an audio cassette, and then I think if we move on, we will have also a Palm Pilot at some point. Here is the audio cassette. Obviously, the obsolescence of... Um, this is a perfect example of yeah. obsolescence. If you show the, the, you know, a tape cassette to somebody who's 16, 17 years old, they don't have the vaguest... Uh, what is that? What was it for? What size was it? What was it made out of? Who, who would have such a thing? So this is the, one of the most obvious examples of that kind of obsolescence. And then there's... A, there's another one here. This is a Palm Pilot. Do you remember the Palm Pilot? It was the very <laughs> first kind of high-tech object. It did something so simple. It, all it did was keep your diary a, you know, a little clumsy, and you had the pen that did the thing. But this was the beginning of this. And now, frankly, if you don't know what it was in the beginning, you're never going to be able to figure. You know, it's a mystery object. It's already <laughs> gone, long gone. If you go back one image, that was the laptop. Uh, it's amazing. <laughs> Laptop, and obviously there you still have a perspective, and then at a certain moment, the objects are mostly frontal. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that shift? Because that's a major shift in the world. Yes, there's a, from the very beginning. If you go back, if we go back to an image like these, these objects are drawn in three-quarter perspective. I drew everything in three-quarter perspective for 15 years. Me, as though I'm, my, my eye line is slightly above the object, and I'm seeing it in, in three, basically in three dimensions. And that's, that's true here. I've drawn the laptop that way. As we go on, I'm going to I'm gonna have to flip through some things to find it. You'll notice that as I go on, the objects become frontal. The objects that, particularly as they refer to a screen, I'm sorry, I'm, going to, I'm getting out of phase here, but I'm going to sh I just want to show you. <laughs> yes, you can see there's a corner of a laptop there. Mm. There. Um, the, the image, the, the, as, as I'm working more and more with things which are, which, are screen, which are essentially screens, if you put them in three quarter perspective, you can't even tell what it is. You can only tell by looking at it frontally. So my, all the drawings start to shift and become now basically seen head on. They're, they're, they're frontal and they follow the plane of, uh, of the canvas itself. If we can go one back, that was the credit card, which is one of the most extraordinary paintings in the exhibition, because obviously we can imagine in the not so you know, distant future when we will have no more credit cards, this could all of a sudden be an abstract painting. We are back to Albos. Well, <laughs> one, of, one of the things that's, uh, I, that I always like doing is in these paintings, I'm playing with a little bit of art history here. There's a little bit of Mondrian in some of them. There's a bit of Judd in others. There's people I, that interest me, but also you can see references. You can see Rothko, you can see Albers, you can see different things. And, and always, uh, it's one of the things that's very, always very interesting in painting is painting isn't a material. Painting's a context. And when you make something that's in the context of painting, it, it puts something back into a, into a very long history in Western art about painting. And so you're always speaking to the past when you're making paintings in an effortless way because every painting refers to every other painting. And then there were a couple of non-tech related images. We, you sort of felt when we worked on the show that it would be great and actually very important to have a few images which are not tech related. No, so we've got remember. the chips. I mean, they're tech related anyhow, but they're different kinds of chips. And we also have the Adidas. Uh, we have the spa shoe, which ties in wonderfully. Yes, I can't remember where anything to is. The panel earlier today, which uh, Jana Peel moderated. Here we yes. have the shoe. 
Yes, I thought it was imp most of the objects in the exhibition uh, at the Serpentine are technological objects because they refer to the lessons of technology. But of course, I thought it was important to have at least one or two uh, other kinds of objects because the, the aesthetic that these objects create seems to me to have an impact on other objects. And things like fast food, uh, designer shoes, these things are these things are all linked with the with the technologies of the computer, the Wi-Fi. All of these things have a uh, have a uh, a conceptual link, but they also have an, uh, a visual a visual linkage in terms of aesthetics. Now we've looked at many many works, and I was wondering, all of their, them are realized. Uh, as you know, my only recurring question in all the interviews is the question of the unrealized projects, projects which have been too big to be realized or too small to be realized. I was wondering, what are the unbuilt roads of Michael Craig Martin? Well, as you can see in some of the installations, I have painted walls. I've done a lot of work with architecture. From an artist's point of view, the only way to make anything really big is to work with architects. Architects all get to work with big things, but if you're an artist, you have to work with an architect. So I've always been interested in architecture and also and working with architects. Uh, and I would like someday to be able to do a building based entirely in imagery. Beautiful. One very last question is also uh, it's also about the unrealized. Uh, is to tell us about things. Uh, you haven't painted, which you wanted to paint, because uh, many years ago, the, the late Alain Rob Grier, I did a talk with him in the US, and we were in the same hotel, and all of a sudden, he, he sent me a letter through the hotel. It arrived in my hotel room. You know, the, the reception gave it to me, and basically, it, it was a very strange letter. He said how difficult it is to, to draw a comb or paint a comb, and that sort of has to do, I think, also with you. Can you tell us about objects which you couldn't paint and you wanted to paint? Yes, there are, paint are there things, are there the language that I use in my drawings is very limited. It's only a line. There are no lines in nature. There's no lines in the human face. There are no lines in any of the objects. It's an entire artifice. Everything to do with line drawing. It's very curious because it's the kind of drawing that we think is most factual. And in fact, there are no lines in any of the things in nature and the things around us. There are no lines here. The lines have to be invented to represent the change of a plane, the edge of something, the, where something disappears in space. These, this is what's, so it's a very limited kind of language. And what, um, so there are certain things that the limitations of my language don't allow me to do. And if I was to draw a comb, it would be so boring and it would be so uninteresting. <laughs> and there'd be so many lines, it wouldn't even look like a comb. So this, this, there are certain objects which you're excluded from my life. Great. Last but not least, I wanted to tell you all that three of these extraordinary works of Michael have been reproduced by DLD as posters. The idea, we always think it's great with the art panel that uh, the works can disseminate into the world, so you're invited all to take these posters that are at the entrance of, of DLD. And Michael, thank you so, so much. Thank you all for being here. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.